Andrew Chen is a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, uh, I'll let you, you know, give the, 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 the pitch on Andreessen, but you sort of co-lead their new $600 million games fund. Um, you, before you were at Andreessen, um, you were a founder yourself. You also sort of merged that company um, into Uber. You ran Uber's um, I think ride or growth product line, um, and then joined Andreessen um, six years ago. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and and uh, and I I, I want to really um, thank Ian as well as the Fenwick team for um, having us, as well as being one of the um, uh, primary sponsors and co-hosts uh, for for Tech Week. Um, and, uh, and and it's been amazing to to work together on that. Yeah. No. So um, we might there there's so much to cover. Um, we might have some time at the end for Q and A. We'll see. Um, but uh, but you know for those uh, of you who have not sort of followed Andrew, I would say read his Substack, um, listen to his podcast. He's incredibly insightful about artificial intelligence, about innovation, about gaming, um, really about sort of everything um, that is sort of at the core of what we're all trying to build, which is you know new companies and innovative solutions um, for the world. So really excited to sort of talk about things. We're going to cover um, a couple different topics. Um, so we're going to sort of get Andrew's thoughts on the current state of AI. We're gonna get Andrew's thoughts on investment opportunities um, in the space, his thoughts on you know, companies that are succeeding or struggling on go-to-market strategies in the space. Um, we're gonna sort of dive a little bit into the New York ecosystem and gaming ecosystem, and then, you know, and then we'll sort of you know, have some closing questions. Um, so let me just kick it off with like, where are we, right? So ChatGPT launched a little over 18 months ago. It feels like a tsunami of change uh, has started, um, but That's it still right. feels like er early in. So give That's us, right. like, you know, set the landscape for us right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most uh, fascinating thing about the the, the the whole the whole technology um, landscape here is many of you guys may may know that a, a lot of the core research that um, uh, went into AI really, you know, was in academia um, in in the 1970s, and and it was really all these technologies, which you know, to, today it's so funny that it's there's this big bucket that's just AI, but you know it's it, there's 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 a ton of research that went through um, you know many decades in order to, to to bring to market, but it was really viewed even as as uh, you know recently as like three or four years ago is almost like a deep tech like kind of weird nerdy thing that was going to cost like. You know, fifty million dollars to get. You know, what, by the way, what what is the product that you're even trying to build, et cetera, et cetera? And then obviously this amazing moment with um, you know that that uh, that that ChatGPT has given us, um, you know, to really build um, uh, you know this this whole this whole movement around it. Um, and so we're very 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 early, you know, in in, in very early innings, and um, and we've sort of viewed it as as really a couple different S curves, um, you know, happening at the same time. Um, and obviously the most important one is all the foundation model development. Um, and we're, we're seeing you know, a really interesting thing there of both the closed um, you know, LLM models as well as you know, Mistral, which is one of our portfolio companies, you know, the open source models and Llama and others that are, that are you know, chasing, chasing Llama. Um, you know, we're, we obviously now see um, in 2D and images um, so much work out of the you know, mid-journey and, and stability folks. Um, and that feels like that's in that's in really that's a, you know that's in really good shape. Um, we we maybe would have all been incredibly thrilled um, a year ago to be able to type in something um, into a text box and have you know this this incredible uh, you know image appear. But now it's kind of like okay, all right. Well, but what else can you do? Like you know, like now now impress me with some video. Now impress me with some interactive stuff. You know. And so I, I think what we're seeing is is that. Um, there's a huge. There's been a huge novelty effect, and we're going to get back to kind of you know kind of what what novelty effect really means in in in, in the case of, of all of us building technology products. Um, but it also means that you know we're going to slowly fill out all the, the foundation model layer, because like how many are we going to have, right? Are we you know eventually you run out of senses, um, so are you going to have are we going to have you know fifty or hundred of them? Probably not. You know like you can imagine there being maybe a dozen. Uh, kind of core foundation model companies that are all incredibly valuable that do you know music and um, 3D and 2D and video and you know and, and maybe there's some some additional specializations um, that become that become interesting companies but like we're gonna start to eventually hit some kind of consolidation point where where that's happening 
And so I think, um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, going back to the regional thing a little bit, is that a lot of the foundational model work is um, is, is kind of all over the place. You know, Mistral's in you know Europe, and, and Eleven Labs is in is, is in London, and a lot of this stuff is in um, is in, uh, in, this, in in the Bay Area, but. The, the most exciting thing about it, I think, is the next S curve that comes on top of that, which is, you know, there's a joke that these days, like every every startup is an AI startup, you know, like every every deck is going to have at least a uh, slide in there that, you know, they're 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 doing AI or not, and and, and that's great, um, you know, but what that means is that there's a, a lot more founders and a lot more entrepreneurs that can take the work that's happening at the foundational layer and actually build, you know, deep verticalized products that really solve problems for, for, for customers. Um, and I know people derisively will call these things like GPT wrappers or, you know, whatever. And then like that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe there's there's a few that are like that. But I'm also just a strong believer in the, the, the power of specialization um, and really custom, um, you know, go-to-market motions and having an account manager and like deep domain expertise. And I think that's going to unlock a lot of really, really interesting you know, industries, whether you're talking about healthcare or real estate or finance or you know, many, many of these other things. And so we're, we're very early, I think, on that, you know, in, in, in that part of the S-curve. Um, and we have probably, you know, um, over half the, the firm at A16Z spending time funding all of these, you know, various areas. And so, um, so it's, it's a very, it's a very exciting time. And, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of different um, guesses as to where, where the S-curve is going to go. But, um, but you know, wow! What 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 a time to be in the tech industry, um, just as everything is changing. You know that that thank you. That that's great. I think one of the I was listening, you know, listening to uh, one of your podcasts recently. I think with um, with Mark Andreessen, um, and you were talking about how um, uh, A16Z is really sort of leaning into, you know, two things. Really, the open source movement um, as it relates to LLMs, and also the policy side of things to ensure that from a regulatory standpoint, um, there isn't sort of regulatory capture that might happen from a government standpoint that might sort of tilt the, the, tilt the tide in favor of the large incumbents and hurt the startup company. So maybe you could sort of talk about those two things, sort of how you view and how A16 views sort of the relevance of open source and the importance of how our government and you know maybe the EU as well sort of like approaches regulation to ensure that the startup companies have a fighting chance to innovate and succeed. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, you know, one one of the points that Mark has made made in the past is that the fact that the internet is an open platform, the fact that we are able to go and build build these websites, and you know we have we have open standards and all that. It might be that that ha is just like a, like it's a it's a fluke, you know. It, it, and and the reason why you can say this is because look, um, at the dawn of computing, if you're looking at IBM and you're looking at OS 360, you're looking at the apps that were built on top of these big mainframe computers. You know, that was a completely closed proprietary system. And when you got the um, you know the, the the PC in everyone's homes, um, you know you you got you got Windows and Intel, right? And um, and, and they were owned by companies, and and we got the internet. Okay, great. That's obviously fantastic, and and we all we all everyone in this room has benefited from that. Everyone in the world has benefited from that. Um, and then you know, and then interestingly enough, with mobile, we went back to a duopoly, right, and, and, and controlled by 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 companies. And so, I think um, you know what that means to me is that the, the the reality is that if we like open, if we like the ability for all of us as founders and entrepreneurs to be able to build new things um, and not have a zillion gatekeepers at every turn, not have the ability where someone disagrees with something that you're doing in your app or one of your users is doing your app and they, and they delete it off, off, off the planet. If we think that that's important, then um, you know, we, we need to believe in, in, in all of these open standards and, and we need to actually fight for it and actually build it. It's, it's not a given if you look at kind of the history of computing. Um, and so, so what, what that means for all of us, and, and look, I mean, it's one of the reasons why A16Z and, and uh, you know, many, many of the folks um, uh, that, that are organizing events this week, you know, why, why we're doing Tech Week is to create um, really a group of people that, like, believes in tech and believes that it can be a force for good in the world, which we all know, but sometimes is not as well, I think, represented um, as, as it could be. And so... So I think you know when it when it comes to um, when it comes to some of the regulatory bodies, I think 
Look, it's, it's, it's a challenge because of a couple dynamics that are, that are happening. Um, you know, the first dynamic is that tech for, you know, I, I, I lived in the Bay Area starting in 2007, and tech was really this like kind of nerdy backwater thing that leave us alone, we're, we're building, you know, like we don't, we don't need to like talk to anybody. Um, but it just became such an important part of the ecosystem and the fabric that all of a sudden, um, you know, what the way that you implemented the, the, the Facebook news algorithm, you know, or whatever, is actually an important like societal topic, right? Um, and, 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 and TikTok and, you know, all, all these other things. Um, and, and so I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of people were caught surprised by that, and I think well, on both sides, right, both that tech got, got this powerful, but also, um, you know, frankly, that, that maybe there could be opportunities to, um, you know, to help and, and, to, um, and, and to do, do good things overall. And, and so I think, I think the challenge that now has been with AI is that a lot of the folks that maybe felt like they were um, behind the curve on regulating social media now feel like, oh, there's a cool new thing to regulate, <laughs> and let's get ahead of the curve. We don't we don't quite understand it yet. And again, we just spent the first you know five minutes of this talking about how early we are in the S curve. It's so early in the S curve, and yet like let's start making rules, okay? And I think it's just so challenging and so dangerous to do that. Um, and and so um, so I think you know. And then the the other big issue with this is that is making the drawing the distinction as as we have as a firm of like big tech and little tech actually have different needs and interests. If you are one of the trillion dollar, you know, incumbents in the industry, you know, actually, you know what, like a lot of regulation might benefit you a lot because you have just, you know, tons of, you know, um, uh, tons of people, tons of headcount, you know, ready to, to go implement all these changes that are required. But if you're, if you're like many of the founders in this room, um, you know, it is actually really tough and really difficult to actually comply with every little thing. Um, and and so it's going to slow you down. It's going to slow all this down. And so um, so I think I think our, our view on it is is uh, let's really figure out um, you know let's keep the innovation engine for America and the broader you know global economy alive, and let's do that by um, you know by 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 having a voice and, and and telling our story of you know how what an amazing thing that um, that AI. Uh, and, and, and Web3 and many of these other technologies can, can bring the world. Um, and, and let's have a voice and let's, let's really tell the story. And, and also, you know, with, with things like Tech Week, get everybody together to, to celebrate, um, you know, what we're all trying to build rather than sometimes some of the more negative things that we see in headlines. Yeah, I, I think that's really, uh, I mean, super important. I, I, I feel like one of the drivers of the, the urgency of regulation is uh, the, the techno-pessimists, right? And you, <laughs> the you, doomers, you, doomers. Right, the doom, right, the doomsayers, right? Yes. And so, um, you know, you've been on record and so have, uh, so is the, your firm of, of being very optimistic about the possibility of change and what technology can bring and what it has brought in the past and what it can bring in the future. Um, so talk a little bit about that because I do think that that is a critical piece to ensuring that not only that like this community and, and the other communities thrive, right? But that, um, you know, the, the the doomsayers do not sort of influence the players, <laughs> right? To sort of overstep their bounds That's and right. really like, you know, diminish what is possible um, uh, with innovation. That's right, yeah, and, and um, you know, two things I'll say. So one of my favorite uh, 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 Twitter accounts and, and, um, and they have podcasts and a bunch of other things is called the Pessimists Archive. And what it is, is it is actually a collection of all these article clips, you know, through the last 200 years, of all the new technologies that have been invented and all the news headlines of people freaking out. Because, you know, for example, like, I mean, these will, some of these things will be so familiar, is that, uh, for example, um, you know, novellas, you know, sort of short form fiction, you know, write-ups, um, had to be in invented, right? Because for a long time, if you had a printing press, you would just print Bibles, just like nonstop, and then you were printing pamphl pamphlets and other things that are mostly non nonfiction in nature. And so the idea of having these like fiction, story-driven kind of things had to be invented. There were there's a whole industry of people, you know, writing these things, and you'll find a headline that's like, well, if we, if so many people are staring at these pages and imagine what their life could be like instead of living real life. You know, it's gonna. This is this is so bad for society, and it's like it reminded me all the things of like you know Black Mirror. Like, what happens if you know everyone stares at their phone? Like, you know, like what's gonna happen? You know, and, and they have one for like bicycles. It's like oh, if we let people 
you know, bike around, then all of a sudden people, all the young people are gonna be dating each other. And like, we're not gonna be able to control who they date, you know? And like, that's, isn't that gonna cause the downfall of society? And so anyway, so it's, it's, just, it's just great. And so I think, I think one of the interesting things is, is just following kind of this pattern that's existed for many years. And, and look, I mean, I think for us, um, we obviously there should be, there are, there are laws, like, it, you know, you, you, if you are asking an LLM or, you know, one of these models to say something or do something, that then allows you to commit a crime. You should obviously that's definitely that should definitely be illegal. I think the I think the interesting challenge is, you know, and, and the recent um, bill that's being discussed in, in, in California as an example is like to what extent should you have laws that dictate things on, you know, tied to like how many parameters a model has or how it works or you know things like that. I think that's I think that's when you're like really reaching in and doing something that, you know, could potentially affect an industry that's really frankly in its infancy. Yeah, and um, yeah, my, my trust in uh, state regulators and, and, and <laughs> don't get me started on that. I'm trying to be nice. Understand to be nice. <laughs> what a parameter is, right? Is uh, is very is very low. No, I mean it's it's being written by staffers, right? And so I think the challenge is, yeah, like people are passing these laws that don't, you know, that it's, it's just yeah, they, 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 nobody fully understands. And and many of you who have watched the congressional hearings where they drag up, you know, kind of various tech leaders and, and, and uh, ask them questions about Wi-Fi codes or whatever. It's just, it's just great because it really tells you a little bit about why like, these, these are the folks that are um, you know, re regulating us. And, um, and actually, one, one, one other kind of quick note on this. If you look at um, the US stock market and you actually take out tech you know, from, from, from the market cap um, and you compare that to Japan and you compare that to um, Europe, what you see is that a lot of the growth of the U.S. economy has fundamentally be, been driven by by tech, um, and and it's really like like frankly like a like a tre like a treasure and a golden goose of um, you know of, of the U.S. economy. And I would just hate to um, you know take one of these waves, one of these S curves, and right before we even figure out how it's going to add value to everyone you know on the planet to to try and and try to squeeze it too hard. Yeah, no, that, that's great, and it is. Um, you know, I, I think it is so amazing that you know when, uh, whenever there's sort of a question about America's leadership in the world, right? Here we have like the latest tech wave. It you know um, certainly seems like even though it's early innings that this is going to be a very dynamic change agent for the entire landscape. Um, whether you're sort of an AI native company or you're a company that just has to adapt to this technology, that's it's right. going to be incredibly impactful and yet here we are leading again. That's, that's right, that's right. And, and look, if we're going to be talking about biotech or defense, you know, look, look at all the drone warfare that's happening. If you're going to talk about finance, you're going to talk about social media. I mean, these are all things that are, are, are going to have AI ultimately underlaying, you know, everything. And so I look at that and I'm like, wow, like this could change a lot of industries all at once. And the U.S. has stands to be able to benefit, and like let's let's see where this can go. I mean, I think I think it's a very exciting time, and simultaneously, obviously, one where we need to be careful about you know what what might happen. Yeah, no, the per and a perfect pivot to uh, the next topic. Let's let's, do it. let's like let's let's put gaming aside because we'll, we want to sort of do that separately. But um, talk about what you're excited about. Like, what do you see as, and what does Andreessen see as amazing opportunities to invest right now in companies that are AI native? Yeah. So um, there's a there's a great uh, blog post that, that my colleague um, Chris Dixon did, um, and he runs the he run, runs the crypto team, and and he had this framework that I just thought was was so great, um, and and it's really one for for Web three, but I think it applies very very well to AI as well. Um, so, so what he said is, look, all of these technologies that are being built, you can easily classify them as being, you know, weak form or strong form, okay? And you know, and 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 every every flavor of technology, there's always a, a weak form version and a strong form version of it, you know. And so, you know, an argument would be, oh, well, if you're going to do internet payments, you're going to do PayPal, okay? Yeah, that's that's sort of weak form, you know, internet payments. Strong form internet payments might be might be Bitcoin, right? Um, and, and you can kind of go down the list and kind of make, make, make all these examples. And I think one of the things that we're seeing today is that we can kind of imagine, you know, if you kind of use the word like co-pilot, for example, and you want to put it next to any industry, you can kind of imagine like what all these products are going to kind of look like. You know, it's like, oh, well, actually, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of companies working on legal right now. Oh, yes. Probably <laughs> some in this room. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so, and so, and you look at that and you say, okay, cool, yeah, like, like uh, you know, 
um, uh, co-pilot for lawyers. It's like, okay, cool. You can immediately imagine what, what that looks like. And, and we are excited about that, and I think those are, those are interesting spaces. I think the, those are weak form, though. Those are the, that, that's the like, nice, friendly version, because you're kind of saying, okay, well, you know, it's going to help everybody in the existing kind of incumbent like industries. Um, and I think the more interesting question is, what is the strong form of all these technologies look like? And I, I want to I want to use a use a quick example of this, which is um, uh, you know if you look at if you look at video um, on the internet, you might have said kind of in the early days that there was a company called called Brightcove, and uh, and and this was based in Boston many years ago, and the idea was okay, let's just take video that's already been captured uh, for TV and movies, etc., and let's host it on the internet, and here's a bunch of infrastructure that helps you do that. Okay, that's right. That's the weak form version of a video. Um, there's a reason why we don't hear about this company very much anymore. Um, the strong form is like YouTube, which is, okay, let's just let anybody upload anything, and it could be any length, and let's just see what happens. And if you were in Hollywood, you might have said, oh no, these guys are gonna go and they're gonna build, um, you know, they're gonna disrupt Hollywood, and they're gonna make TV shows and this and that. Turns out they, they, they're not. They're actually gonna make cooking videos and travel vlogs and like unboxing. I mean, if you told me that there would be, you know, millions of hours of unboxing content on the internet and that people actually want it, want to watch that like that's shocking you know that's shocking but that is the strong form version of what it is so so i think in a lot of these cases it's you know like we'll we'll see a pitch that's like ai the ai dating app and it's going to make it so that people can you know chat with each other you know on the thing and and that's a cool weak form version and then there's the strong form version that's like ai you know girlfriend or boyfriend or you know slash whatever and it's going to be a digital companion, and, and it's actually going to be um, more engaging and interesting to talk to than, than a human. And like those, those are the ones that are, I think are the ones that um, can potentially break out into entirely new markets. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, and and so and so we so we could go through each industry and kind of say, okay, what's the weak form version? What are the strong form versions? I'm always so attracted to like the strong form versions because you know that it might take a little while to figure out, but then you know if it works, it, it can it can really um, you know change things. So I think that, that that's good framework to go. Ahead. Yeah, and and so how do you think about um, and how do you talk to either your portfolio companies or founders that you're getting to know and thinking about making an investment about how they're positioning their business? And maybe it's weak form, strong form, um, but also like how um, how do you think about the large LLMs ability to hoover up the next you know set of applications, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Which seems to be like a thing in the sort of very early stages of of this sort of AI wave is that all of a sudden you know, the next thing you know OpenAI does something and a lot of businesses that people thought that they could build just disappear. Right. And how do you think about that and how you know, would you advise a founder to, whether it's building a moat or sort of building a different business that has some protection against that issue? Yeah, that's right. Well, I think, um, so So the first thing is uh, to, to just say this as, as, as positively as possible is like, right now this age of, um, uh, this, this, new, new, this new wave of AI um, apps is awesome because of the novelty effect that it's bringing to the market. And what that means is that if you look at all these products, just the growth rate, if you just announce a new AI app, the growth rate of getting to your first million users and then to your first million dollars of revenue, I mean, we're seeing companies do this in weeks right now, and which is, which is, which is amazing. And, so, and that, that, is, that is like at its core, you know, I've spent a lot of my time in, in previous companies helping them on distribution and thinking about viral growth and all these other things. I mean, it is amazing to have such a strong novelty effect kind of across the whole space, across hundreds of products, that you just have incredible top of funnel immediately. Um, and, and so I think it's, it is an amazing time to take advantage of that. And, and for a lot of these uh, startups that, that I'm working with to, um, you know, to, to have an AI angle to what they're doing so that they can sort of ride this wave. It is very, very hard, you know, this is a, a point that Mark Pincus from uh, who's founder of Zynga often makes, it's very, very hard to create your own waves. Um, what founders need to do, you know, and, and, and by the way, like things like VR, you know, give you an example of like, you can spend $10 billion a year and it's incredibly hard to make that, make that into a thing. Um, whereas, you know, we're all, you know, surfing the AI wave right now and part of that is embracing the fact that 
um, it's an amazing, you know, top of funnel, um, uh, you know, engine, and the investors have their wallets out, and everyone's excited, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now the challenge, of course, is, you know, you gotta have like the small fish, you know, being chased by a slightly larger fish, being chased by, you know, a, a, another fish, which is that the folks that are basically building, um, you know, fine tunes on these these, uh, you know, existing models. Um, you know, if there's a new, if, you know, GPT-4.0, you know, comes out, all of a sudden, all the fine-tunes that you did on GPT-3 may be not so good. Like, and so you're always kind of trying to create, create uh, enough delta. And then on top of that, um, funny enough, for, for all the, all the closed-source guys, um, you know, all the open-source LLMs are, like, chasing them, and they're only, you know, they're less, they're probably three, three to six months you know, behind at any given point, right? And so you're just seeing a very, very dynamic environment. And so I think, I think if you think about like, well, what is it that is actually going to be required to be ultimately very, very to make your product very sticky? So like, you're going to onboard a bunch of users. That's going to be relatively easy. And then it's a question of okay, well, you know, how do you have what's how, what do you make what do you do to make things sticky beyond that? I think you have to then look at you know, it's, it becomes a little bit old school, mm -hmm. right? It's either like. You know, you are you know their business so well. You're so far into their workflows. You know, you you you've you've sold into Fenwick. You're you know, you, Fenwick has adopted, and and as a result of that, um, you know, there's just an enterprise motion that can be very very strong, and that might be the enterprise version of this. And then the other, you know, the more consumer version would be, you know, if you're building collaboration tools, you're building these apps. You know, you, you have to want to use a product because all your coworkers use the product, the way that Slack and Zoom work, or the way that. Um, you know, social app works, and so I think those are those are like I think right now there's a lot of novelty effect. It's it's generating a top of you know tons of top of funnel, and then I think the stickiness is just going to be you know more more basic things that we've had for a long time. And so I think it's things are so exciting on you know um, uh, w w watching things emerge on, on social media that that we often don't talk about what the retention statistics kind of look like after you know, the, the, the Big Bang launches. And I'll tell you as someone that actually gets to see a lot of this data, a lot of it is not good. A lot of it is, you know, if you look at like day 30, like how many folks are still using these products, it's not great. However, the folks that can get paid subscribers, you know, that, that retention looks much stronger. And so I think, I think you, 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 you gotta lean into that. Yeah, it's, it's actually something that we, we're, we're seeing and experiencing very much as a law firm, right? Um, so just like any other business, we're being sold into in a meaningful way. I do think that um, legal is clearly an area that AI can and will be very impactful. Um, but, you know, lawyers, just like lots of other professionals, are tricky animals. Uh, habit change is very hard. We'll experiment with a variety of things. It's hard to make those things stick and make people change. And I think what ultimately will yield real results is figuring out how to cater to different kinds of lawyers, how to build um, you know, a user interface that works with how they work, right, in their workflow in a way that feels comfortable to them and in a way that actually really moves the, med moves the needle in a meaningful way, right? And that's what we have been sort of like looking at a variety of different legal tech products that we're sort of actively experimenting with, like that's kind of what we're searching for and I'd imagine like other businesses are doing the same and so I think the, the tip for the founders that I speak to, like regardless of whether they're selling it to law firms or whether they're selling somewhere else, sort of, it's a similar thing to what you're saying, right? It's like you gotta sort of figure out how to get the, the fit right for who you're actually trying to provide a leverage that's right, and I imagine in your world, you know, there's a bunch of compliance requirements, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of, you know, security things, yep. and like trying to make sure, you know, and, and, and those are great for these very vertical companies to lean into. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's going to, you know, I think the tough thing is going to be there's going to be a whole kind of middle of companies that could kind of help you guys, but like, you know, but they're not quite like fully customized for the legal, you know, kind of profession, and so, you know, and then and then in that case, as the as the market kind of evolves, they may find themselves you know very much squeezed you know for that. So I, th I think that some of the most dangerous in, you know sort of investments in, in my eyes are often the ones that where you're talking about a very horizontal you know thing. Like you're 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 going to be the fifth or sixth player uh, in this niche of being able to generate you know video clips. It's really hard for those like these hyper competitive. Um, in these hyper-competitive markets, I think for the um, for the horizontal players to survive. So you, I think I think you got to go very very verticalized um, unless unless you have a shot to be kind of number one or number two. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm curious. I mean, you you so you've been an investor for six years, right? So you were an investor in many portfolio companies that existed before this AI wave. I'm curious, like how you're seeing um, the successful portfolio companies, right, that were non-native AI, right, but had to then figure out like what do they do, right? Like how do they actually adapt their business in different ways? Everyone needs an AI strategy of some sort. Um, what are you seeing the successful portfolio companies that are not AI native um, do to sort of adapt to the AI world and stay competitive? Yeah. Well, I, I think the um, I think one of the the hardest parts for the the these companies that have been around for you know let's say five years um, and and then all of a sudden you have this AI wave is that de facto everything that they're, they're, the temptation will be to make everything in their product strategy and their product roadmap ultimately be a weak form implementation. Because it, because because it's so hard to think about your product that you have that, you know, all, all of your customers like, et cetera, et cetera, and then for you to really sit down and think, okay, if I were to do this from scratch today, what am I, what, 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 what would I actually do? And so I think what tends to be the easiest, I mean, you know, to touch on, on game studio companies for, for a second, what's very easy for, for folks like that to grok are, is, is like, okay, I'm building a game, it's gonna cost tens of millions of dollars, I'm going to give my artists this like co-pilot thing, and then as a result of doing that, they're going to be able to make their 3D models 50% cheaper. Like that is like very they can just understand that, and I, and I think everyone you know everyone that is in an industry where there is there are these weak form products should just go adopt them, and and I think and I think that's fine. I think the the challenge is to get them to think kind of originally as 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 we're talking about of like okay no if you were to start the company again. Um, disrupt yourself, mm -hmm. you know, like, would you actually make your home screen the way it is? Would you actually make your, you know, kind of, um, uh, kind of primary interaction, would you actually make it, um, you know, what you set out to be, or would you kind of change it dramatically? And a, a, a good example of this, I'm on, I'm on the board of a company called Substack, and, you know, Substack's a wonderful company, it allows people to, to publish a newsletter, and, um, and I, I write a newsletter on there. And one of the things that I love about what Chris Best, who's the CEO there, um, has done is he's, he's hosting hackathons like every month right now, getting his team, um, you know, to build like little plugins and, and you know, do we, what, what do we change about kind of like the, the product experience and just experimenting. And he himself is like, you know, building on top of all of these kind of various LLMs to see what's actually possible and, 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 to, and to really bring, and, and, and now he has a bunch of awesome ideas of, you know, you can imagine, you know, if you have a lot of text, as Substack does, and they also have podcasting, and they can do transcripting, and they can do a bunch of stuff with video, like, that's all very, very interesting. Um, and, and maybe there is, should be a writing co-pilot, and maybe there should be, you know, he has all these ideas that are kind of based on that. And I, and I think it's still early enough in the S-curve where a lot of companies are able to adopt. And if you look at the mobile wave, which, you know, sometimes this, the, this AI wave is kind of compared to, um, you know, for a lot of folks, it took them years to actually adopt mobile, and it ended up, for some folks, it ended up being fine. Like LinkedIn's a good example. They were mostly a web property, you know, Airbnb, same thing, mostly a web property, primarily benefiting from SEO, and they took a couple years, extra years, to build their mobile app, and it ended up being fine. The challenge is if you're in one of these markets that like, you know, on mobile, where you, you were AOL Instant Messenger, or you were ICQ, or you were, um, you know, one of these, and then, you know, WhatsApp is about to appear, like, it's actually existential for you, right? And so I think, I think one of the interesting parts will be just looking at, you know, what particular product category that you're in, and how existential would it be, <laughs> you know, to have, a, have an income, and, and, and if you're in, for example, you know, content creation tools, or you're in video, if you're Adobe, of course you have to be, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, you have to turn that, that battleship, like, immediately, because of what's about to happen. Yeah. So. Uh, you, you brought up gaming, so why don't, let's let's pivot to gaming, That's right? Um, uh, talk about speed run, right? This is you know sounds amazing, right? Um, for those unfamiliar, right? This is um, I think what thirty to forty companies that you should right. bring in in a very early stage investments um, at the cross section of sort of games and AI and technology. Um, so talk a little bit about like what is your like what are you trying to accomplish there? It's a very different strategy than. Yeah, that are, that are yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Strategy. Yeah. So look, I think if you if you look at um, you know, this is a little bit. Many of you follow Andreessen Horowitz in the news, but you know, one of the most interesting things that A16Z has been doing over the last couple of years. You know, when I joined the firm, it was under 100 people. 
all of us went to Menlo Park and sat around a table every day on Sand Hill Road, and it was a very like traditional, you know, firm. And it's amazing that you know six years later how different it is. Um, and we have offices in New York, and we're opening our new LA office soon. Um, and we obviously have our SF office. We, we have one, in, and we have one in London. And the structure of the funds has also been changing as well. So rather than having one central kind of venture fund that kind of does everything. What we've been doing is we've been building these vertical funds. So there's um, a bio fund, a crypto fund, a gaming fund that's us. There's um, American Dynamism, which was just uh, launched as well this year, headed by um, two, two of my favorites, uh, uh, Catherine Boyle and, and David Yulovich. Um, and, and, and so, so you know, the really interesting thing about building these vertical funds is you're often, you know, maybe, maybe a good question to start with is like, why even build a vertical fund? You know, why not just do the investments out of, out of the main fund? And I think what we ended up realizing and deciding is that, look, like, um, a lot of these industries, and, and American Dynamism is a good example, and gaming is a good example, crypto is a good example, they're just their own ecosystems. They have their own conferences, their own alumni networks, <coughs> their own, you know, kind of constellation of important companies. And, um, and, and, and so you build a vertical fund in order to um, go into these ecosystems and really plant the flag and build it out in, in a way to, to, to be able to tell the entrepreneurs like, hey, this is not just like a onesie twosie investment, you know, into the sector. Like we are we are here, we're a multi, we're gonna build multiple funds, we're gonna hire a full time team. All we care about is your space. And so because of that, that's the commitment that we have to your company as well. Right. And so for, for gaming, we we started it, you know, for a bunch of different reasons. One of the main reasons is that we sort of see it as the next major um, social social network paradigm, right? Um, if you go back and you look at what, uh, you know, teenagers and kind of young people are doing doing with their time, you know, they're playing, you know, Minecraft, they're playing Roblox, they're playing Fortnite. Um, a lot of the most interesting things that are happening from a consumer standpoint, just overall, touch gaming, you know, whether you're talking about streamers and influencers, or you're talking about esports or, 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 or any of these, so, so you know what we did was when we kicked off the games fund, we sort of thought, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go invest in all the known amazing founders. So we went and invested in Nate Mitchell, who's the co-founder of, uh, of Oculus and his new you know company. We invested in um, Chris DeWolf, who founded uh, Jam City and MySpace in his in his new company. We we went and invested in the creators of League of Legends and World of Warcraft and like all all these amazing founders. But we also sort of thought. You know, okay, this is great, but like, what about all the like college students that are you know gonna like build something in their dorm room? What about all the folks that are um, super early in their career? Like, how do we you know if they have an amazing insight, how do we invest in those people? So, to to answer your question, with Speedrun, we sort of thought this is an amazing opportunity for us to tell the world like we are we are investing. We're very happy to be first money in. Um, you don't have to have a product. You can literally just have some slides, you know, or like a sketch of an idea, we'll invest um, and be first money in. And um, and so we, to give you guys a sense of it, in the last batch when we announced that this was gonna happen, we had 4,000 companies apply. We have interviewed 400 of them-ish. Um, and and we start with a, with a 10 to 15 minute interview and then we kind of dig in from there. And then we're gonna fund, um, you know, roughly 40 of those companies. And it's a super, super exciting thing. And not only do we do that, um, and it's not all gaming companies, it's actually AI and infrastructure, and it's gamified kind of consu consumer apps, like kind of um, the Duolingos and Twitches and that kind of thing of, of, of the world. But after we're done with all that, it's great because we also then get to share all of these companies with our favorite seed investors and angel investors and VCs and really use these demos days as a way to like really collect all the important people in the ecosystem, and, and bring everybody together, and like build the ecosystem together, right? And, that, and, that, and that's been that's been the thinking with, with all. So so we ha we have a demo de we have a accelerator program. The crypto uh, team actually has one called CSX um, that's running in London right now, um, and uh, and I'm I'm sure this will only expand in the future. Yeah, I, what I love about that is it, it gets back to the whiteboard example that you were using before, right? You're, you know. Funding and incentivizing entrepreneurs at the very beginning of their journey to think differently about the ecosystems that you're focused on, right? And they can, with sort of the AI wave and sort of different aspects of how that might change um, the gaming industry in this example, right? They can actually look at something and create 
entirely new games or entirely new way of, of gaming. That's right. right? That's right. Like, that's right. I mean, your podcast with um, with Mark recently, right? I think uh, Mark was talking about how he plays games with his sons, and then he was sort of punting about right. right? <laughs> what games might be. Yes. And how we think about games in a certain way, and he, I think uh, at one point he said, well, a game might last like 5,000 hours or something, like, <laughs> something crazy. But who knows, right? If you sort of are able to start with a completely clean slate, you can have some incredible innovation. That's right. And I think it really is the founders that are like six months ahead of the investors, mm -hmm. and then the investors are maybe, you know, a couple months ahead of like kind of the press and kind of ma mainstream, you know, kind of tech, because, and it really comes down to like the founders that are out there that are closest to all the trends and all the new technologies, like they're the ones that tell us where the world is going to go. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I always feel enormously privileged to be to be the recipient of, of, of all the knowledge. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, like where you see sort of um, the intersection of gaming and where you live right now in L.A., right? Because mm -hmm. gaming is usually like pretty far ahead of where entertainment is. Um, but, you know, AR, VR. AI, games, social, all of those things eventually sort of intersect with the entertainment world. That's right. Um, that's and right. have a real influence over that. So how do you sort of envision what that future might might hold and where those two industries might be sort of heading together? Yeah, so I think we're seeing a lot of kind of, you know, I think gaming, it, it's, it's such an interesting um, uh, audience because there's a lot of people who are actually spending a lot of money playing and a lot of time uh, gaming, but would never identify as a gamer. That's 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 a very kind of, and that's where all the market growth is actually happening. Is like people playing Wordle and like mm -hmm. you know your 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 folks that are will do that love doing crossword puzzles or Sudoku, and then they'll say no no, but I'm but I'm not a gamer, right? Because they think of that as like first person shooters and you know all, all that. And so I think one of the things that we're seeing is just this amazing rapid expansion of of gaming, touching all of these adjacent sectors. So so many of you may have seen recently that. Um, there was an analysis of all the time that's being spent in the New York Times properties. And the graph is amazing because it's like the New York Times, you know, dot com kind of news section is it's like pretty flat. And there's a section that's like New York Times games, and it's like every year it was growing and growing and growing and growing. And this last year was the first year where it's actually the majority of minutes being spent on the New York Times is um, is is in gaming, not not the news property. So you know, so so the the argument in, in 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 this chart is like, look, you know, this is getting added into the New York Times bundle. It's the majority of minutes already, and it might be that in five years we're going to think of the New York Times as a, as a gaming company that happens to have like this weird, you know, news news division, <laughs> like this thing that I used to read. Yeah. You know, like did you know they actually used to print these these things out? It's like crazy. Um, so yeah, so 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 that's like one flavor, and then. Um, you know, Netflix has a huge gaming effort that's happening. They have nine studios. If you open up the, the Netflix app on your mobile phone, you'll see it's part of your subscription. Look, for them, it's like, if you're going to spend $100 million on a show, you could spend, you know, a couple chunks of $20 million, you know, checks to, to license games and put them in the app, and then people will burn through all the content. And that's an amazing value prop for what they're trying to do. Amazon Prime, they have, game, they have gaming in their bundle. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there's Apple Arcade and like on and on and on. So I think you're seeing this really interesting thing where all the media companies are starting to, to, to bundle in gaming and I think that's going to expose um, a, a lot of folks. And then the other interesting thing is just in popular culture. I mean, over the last 18 months we had The Last of Us TV show, the Fallout TV show on, on, on Amazon is doing quite well. Um, and then we also saw things go in the other direction, which is like, you know, Harry Potter going to a video game, Hogwarts Legacy, which made hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and, uh, and, and, and many other examples. So I think it's a very exciting time to see the convergence of, um, you know, of, of the whole industry. I think it is mostly, interestingly enough, I, um, I've had a lot of conversations, you know, li living in LA, I live in Venice, um, you know, just chatting with folks that are from all the various large uh, entertainment companies. I would say they're mostly scared by technology. It's mostly like a, like defensively, kind of in, in in that culture, because they're and AI, like you know, has, has been at the focus of actually some of the strikes um, uh, as well uh, from from writers and so on, you know, in this because they want to basically actually try to get people to sign contracts that say we're, you are not allowed to use virtual AI voice actors, you know, in your video games, or you're not allowed to you know use use music that's like kind of sample. So, so I think we're we're seeing a, a lot of that there, but I think look the 
the entertainment industry, if you just look at all the minutes, people are watching fewer and fewer TV shows, they're watching more short form clips, they're playing more video games. I mean, like this is where like all entertainment is, is going. And underlying it is software. Uh, because game, gaming is software, you know, these short form video platforms are software. And so I think in, in the tech industry, we, we certainly will, will benefit and be able to drive the agenda on, on many reasons. Yeah, that's, um, I'm gonna use the New York Times. What, full disclosure, their client, and we did. Are the, they? And we did the word acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great acquisition. I didn't do it. My colleagues. What did a great it. acquisition. Got a great acquisition. So you're welcome, Wordle fans. Um, but I'm going to use that as just a way to, as we begin to kind of wrap up, um, pivot back to New York, and talk about what you see as sort of unique and special about this community, and where you see like. Um, the most interesting investment opportunities or the ability to build businesses in New York that might be unique from other ecosystems? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the Bay Area is great at what it does and it has been dominant in the past and it will remain dominant kind of forever. Now, I think what's, what's interesting though is um, for a long time it wasn't clear what the number two tech ecosystem was going to be. You know, is it LA, is it Austin, is it Seattle, is it, is it New York, is it London, like what is it? I think post COVID, it's very clearly, if you're not gonna be in the Bay Area, you're, you, you're gonna be in New York. I mean, I think it's, it's, that's super, super obvious. Like that is, that is facts now. And so, um, so, so I think that has created a, a really interesting uh, gravitational pull within, within New York to be able to access Europe, to be able to access the rest of the East Coast. Um, and, and, there, and what it means is that, you know, because New York is close to all of these impo very important industries, whether you're talking about finance or government or, you know, um, uh, uh, much of world trade, um, it's just a really exciting place to um, build companies that touch those areas. If you're going to build a, you know, foundational model company, yeah, probably better. <laughs> you should probably do that in, in San Francisco. And, and if you, once you start hiring engineers, you're going to be forced to go out there. But but for all these other sectors, I think I think it's very exciting. And one of the big things for you know for tech, for Tech Week um, that that we've been thrilled by is when we when we organized SF, LA, and New York last year combined, it was 700 events overall. And in New York this week is um, sorry combined it was a thousand overall. And in this week in New York it's 700, right? And it just tells you. Um, you know how how deep the ecosystem is that you can have, uh, you know this much going on. And when you look at the calendar, it's like every single industry, every tons of different companies. Um, and we'll crunch the numbers later, but you know I think I think a tremendous number of percentage of people actually traveled to come to New York because it is such a destination. And that's the kind of thing that it's it's just much harder to imagine folks, you know, going to to some of these other cities. Um, and so so I, so I think I think it's. Uh, uh, the, the last couple of years have played out very, very well for the New York tech ecosystem. You know, I mean, this, um, again, com uh, from just last October, which was the first New York Tech Week to, to now, right, so less than a year, it's incredible, like, how, um, how much this event has grown. Yeah. And as we've talked about before, the thing that I think is really innovative about what you've, um, and the rest of the Andrews team have built with the tech weeks, right, is you sort of, You've allowed creativity to be the driver of what and where this event can go, um, and haven't sort of given it constraints. So it sort of like touches back. To these, <laughs> well, most conferences about, are closed, right? And this right. isn't this is open, right? That's right. So it's, it's, it's open, yeah, it's, right? it's very much you know, this. haven't really sort of constrained the creativity of the community, right? Instead of doing that, like having it at a particular venue with a set agenda, you know, how you might be a speaker or not be a speaker, really, like in a way that you've talked about building your companies, right, and building different ecosystems, right? What you've done here with Tech Week, which I think is amazing, um, is really just allowed the communities to sort of drive that That's engagement right. in, in all different ways. That's right, yeah, and may, maybe my, my, my final plug on, on the Tech Week thing is, for those of you that are that are in doing something B2B and you're selling into either the startup ecosystem or SMBs and so on, the cool thing about organizing one of these events is you basically get it onto the calendar and you'll walk away with a, a lead list of like, you know, potentially thousands of emails and people that are interested in the topic that you've created. Now, sometimes, you know, you have to turn away a lot of people and you can just host, you know, whatever your menu accommodates. Um, but it's really like, I think a no-brainer no for anybody that is, is, is doing stuff in B2B to host. And like, we intend to, you know, there's a, there's a whole team 
uh, that's working on it these, these days. Rose in, in, in the blue jacket is one of them, and I think there, there's a couple other folks uh, here. Uh, but you know, we, we intend to continue expanding this and do this over multiple years, and um, would love to you know, partner with all of you for, for, for this tech week and beyond. Amazing. Um, I think that's, I think we could wrap it up there. Um, so, uh, and do you want to take a question or two? No, 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 no let's go. Okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, think, I think that's a good, I think that's a good close. Let, I think that's a good close. Yeah, so look, I, let, let's, let's have a big round of applause for Andrew. And a big round of applause for his team at Andreessen Horowitz for putting together an amazing oh, yeah. tech week. Thank you, everybody. Cocktails. Thank you. <laughs>